the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. We get a snippet of quite a dramatic part of the story of Elijah this morning in our reading from the Old Testament that was read to us uh, in Persian. So if you haven't understood the Persian, it's in here in um, the English. Elijah has just been involved in a big conflict with the prophets of Baal who are the prophets who, who follow the God of Baal, the, the competitor to Yahweh, to the God of Israel. And Jezebel, the queen who has led the people to follow the prophets of Baal, is annoyed with Elijah because Elijah had this competition with the prophets of Baal where he set up a big altar and said, whosoever God is the true God will set fire to this altar. And he said to the prophets of Baal, you go first and have a go. So they danced around the pyre, the altar, and were conjuring up gods, and the fire was not starting. So, so Elijah teased them, and he said, oh, perhaps Baal is asleep. He cannot hear you. Or perhaps Baal needs to be woke up. Shout louder, shout louder, sing louder. And the Bible says they were going on and on for hours and hours until they were exhausted. And then Elijah just prayed and the pyre went whoosh. And then they dragged all the prophets of Baal down to the river and slaughtered them, which isn't so nice. Right? So, so then this is just after this. And now Elijah has heard that Jezebel is really peed off, right? And she's out to get him. So he disappears into the desert, into the wilderness. And we get this place here where he is desperate and in despair. He's desperate and in despair. And it's interesting, he's desperate and in despair, despite the fact that he's kind of apparently shown that his God is the greatest and the true, the one true God. He's struggling. That's what it says. It says, but Elijah himself went a day's journey into the wilderness of the desert and came and sat under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. He's desperate. He's despairing. Perhaps he's even depressed. Then he lay down under the broom tree, it says, and fell asleep. But an angel of the Lord came to him, sent by God, and encouraged him, encouraged him to eat. Get up and eat, he said. He looked, and there was a head, was a cake, baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again to him and encouraged him to take some more sustenance. And said, you are to go on a journey, a journey of 40 days to Mount Horeb. Now, as I've said before, it's important we know our Bibles because these stories are full of symbolism. Why is it 40 days? The journey is 40 days. What about the 40 years that the people spent in the wilderness? This is another time of God's testing and struggle with God, just as in Exodus we had the people walking for 40 years in the wilderness, in the desert, so Elijah has 40 days from this journey of his despair to the revelation he will receive at Mount Horeb, the same mountain at which Moses was given the Torah, the first five books of Moses, according to tradition and according to the Bible. These things are connected. We're told these stories in this way for a reason because we're told to wake up. 
this is really important. And the thing is, you need to know your Bible to be able to see these wake-up moments. This is an important part of the story. And so what happens to Elijah? He goes to Mount Horeb. And there, he hears God's voice. But not in the wind, not in the thunder, not in the lightning, not in the violent wind, but in the still, small voice. God calls to him to come out of the cave where he is hiding, and he hears God. Not in the wind, not in the thunder, not in the lightning, but in the still, small voice. And also God reveals to him that he is not alone. Because he tells him, he tells him that there are others waiting, waiting for him to join with him in the struggle against the Baalites. And he is not alone. And neither is he the one who is to lead all the time. There are people who are going to pick up his mantle people who are going to pick up his mantle, not least Elisha. But he is told this at this revelation at Mount Horeb, the same mountain at which Moses was given the Torah, the five first, first five books of our Bible. And what does this mean for us? What does this say to us? Well, maybe... Elijah was despairing. Maybe Elijah was doubting what he had done and whether the massacre was the right thing after God had revealed himself. Maybe he was questioning that. Maybe he was questioning that. And maybe God wanted him to question that. And after God had shown his power for Elijah, and what did Elijah do? Elijah then slaughtered the prophet's body. Is that what God wanted? Who knows? But maybe he's questioning that. Maybe he's questioning that. And maybe he's struggling with all this responsibility that God has given him. But also maybe he's a bit depressed with the weight of the responsibility, with the fear of Jezebel, with the fear of what might happen to him, with the fear of oppression, with the fear of not knowing of not knowing what's going to happen to him. He lays down in the desert and says, Oh God, take my life away from me. It is too much. And maybe some of us have felt like that sometimes in our lives. Sometimes in the struggles that we've had to face. Maybe we haven't faced the prophets of Baal, but maybe we've faced other forces of evil and violence. Maybe we struggle sometimes with issues of depression. And the message of this is Elijah the prophet, who is held up within our Bible as one of the great prophets of Israel, Struggled, struggled himself, struggled deeply with his calling, struggled deeply with what he had to face in life. Elijah the prophet in the Bible struggled just as we struggle, just as we struggle. And Elijah also experienced the tender hand of God Maybe he had, you know, committed that violence, not necessarily called to do so by God. God brought down the fire, but maybe he doesn't, but he could have, and maybe he questioned that. But the tender hand of God came to him through the angel, the messenger, who brought him food and encouraged him to go the next step of his journey. The next step of his journey. 
maybe we've had that experience of the tender hand of God touching us as we struggle on our journeys, as we struggle on our journeys of life, as we struggle on our journeys. Maybe, God, we have felt that tender hand of God, or maybe we felt it's not there. It's not there. And that's also been really difficult. But what's interesting about this story too is that Elijah in the end discovers he's not alone. He is not alone. Because we are not alone. You know, we're encouraged in this world to think of ourselves as individuals. You know, we're encouraged increasingly in our world to a sense of individualism and away from a sense of community. But we are not alone. And that's what the Ephesians reading, what Pete, Paul is saying in the Ephesians reading this morning. He's talking about community. He's talking about Christian community and how we should be with one another, forgiving, loving, caring for our neighbors, looking towards each other. In a world that often feels very difficult, we are here to be for one another. And that's what Paul calls us to in the reading from Ephesians. And sometimes, perhaps we need to look up, to look up as Elijah was encouraged to look up by God who called him out of the cave at Mount Horeb and spoke to him in a still small voice, but also told him, there are many more of you. It's not all up to you. There are many more of you. Join with them. And I was thinking of that in the stories we've had in the last few weeks in this country, the terrible things that have happened in this country. The terrible things with far-right groups attacking places of worship, attacking hotels in which our resident asylum seekers, like many of you, are here in local hotels here. Thankfully, that hasn't happened in Wolverhampton. Thank God. But it's happened elsewhere. Terrible things that have happened. And I told last week the story of my friend, the priest in Sunderland, who was protecting the gravestones, the gravestones in their graveyard, the Sunderland Minster, from rioters wanting to break them up, to throw them at police and to throw them at the local mosque down the road. But what happened the next day? Eight o'clock, Chris was out on the street with hundreds Hundreds of people who turned up at 8 o'clock to clear the streets. Not just workers from the council, but volunteers who just turned up to do so. And the same happened in Southport. The same happened in other cities. And then last week, when there was a threat of attack on immigration centers, thousands, thousands, thousands of people came out. Thousands of people came out to protect those immigration centers, those solicitors' office who were helping asylum seekers, and those support centers that were threatened with attack. Thousands upon thousands came out. We are not alone. We are not alone. We are not alone. I want to hear it, church. Are we alone? We are not alone. Just like Elijah, God has pointed us to the reality that actually really, really, despite what evil, and with this is evil, what we are dealing with, it, it is demonic forces. It is, it is the evil one. It is the evil one. Look at some of the contorted faces. Look at some of the contorted, look at the way people behave. It's like possession. It's like possession. And then look at how people of love respond with community, with clearing up, with gathering, with supporting neighbors who are different from them, who seeing people as their neighbors. So important. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. God does not leave us alone. The devil tries to create confusion. God brings community and harmony. 
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And we've got to see it. We've got to see it because sometimes we don't see it because the people who make the devil likes to make a lot of noise. Likes to make a lot of noise. Whether it's on social media or whether it's in the street. Likes to make a lot of noise. God works through hope, through work, through people working together in community with love. Those people who turned out days after riots, those people who turned out to protect immigration centers, who parted as they were doing so. That's love. That's the Holy Spirit. So let's be awake to that. And just as Elijah was fed by the angel of the Lord. In our gospel reading this morning, we hear yet again, like we've heard the last couple of weeks, that Jesus is the bread of life. And I preached on that last week, but we hear again, Jesus is the bread of life. So just as Elijah was physically fed by food from the angel of the Lord to sustain him, so we have spiritual food, my sisters and brothers, which is here in this place today for you at the Eucharist. The spiritual food that can give us the strength to see and to hear God's still small voice in the beauty of community, in the beauty of neighborliness, in the beauty of people loving one another in the face of hatred and violence. So come and receive the bread and wine. Come and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let that power go into your bodies, run through your veins, that you may be people of hope, that you may be able to see the hope that God presents before us. And also, if you are struggling at this moment, feel in that Eucharist just a touch of God upon your shoulder. The touch of God upon your shoulder, just as the angel of the Lord touched Elijah on his shoulder and said, eat, eat. And maybe you won't be ready to get up and walk the 40 days, but just take that little bit of sustenance and that little bit of hope that's given here at the Eucharist. Given here at the Eucharist. No matter how you feel, God wants you to receive it, to take it, and let God work his love in you. In the name of God, our life giver, our pain bearer, and our love maker. Amen.